church, uh, and we just helped them out however they needed at the time for that month, and then we would go to the next country the next month. So what I want to do is kind of explain to you what we did in each country, what it was like a little bit, and, the, and their needs there. And then at the end, if you have questions, uh, you can let me know. But the first month, we, uh, me and my team traveled to Macedonia. So I don't know if you know where Macedonia is, but it's just above Greece, over in Eastern Europe. Uh, and we were specifically in their second biggest city. It was called Bitola. Um, now, one thing you have to know about Eastern Europe is it's very heavily Orthodox Christian. Um, there's only maybe 2% two, two or less in the whole country of Macedonia that are um, anything other than Orthodox Christian. And then the next biggest minority group would be Muslims. So not a lot of Protestant Christians. Now, um, the thing with Orthodox Christianity, at least in Euro Eastern Europe, is that it's very heavily traditional, which means that the priests and everything else in that culture, um, they, have a, they have the knowledge of the Bible, but they tell everyone else not to read the Bible at all. They will tell them what it means. Um, so you have a lot of, most of the people in the country that we met that were Orthodox Christian. Orthodox Christian meant that they were born in that, or they did some sort of ceremony into the church, and then they just went and did those ceremonies. A lot of times they didn't really understand what they were. They didn't really understand what the, the Bible said or what it meant for as far as Jesus being uh, the salvation, like you were saved by his grace through faith. They didn't really understand that. It was a lot of you're saved by being a part of the Orthodox Church. So in this city, it was over a little over 100,000 people. And just to give you an idea, the pastor that we were there with, he told us there are maybe 20 true Christians in the whole city. So if that gives you a little bit of an idea. Interesting thing, too, is his small church usually had a little over 20 people come anyways, and there was two other churches there. But he said a lot of the people that came to his church were interested, but they weren't Christians yet. He had a small core group that, that uh, he said knew about Christ and were actually Christians. Uh, and another thing you got to understand about a culture like that, everyone in that church who was members of that church who were Christians— did everything. It was it was very interesting. Whenever we worked with the church, they were all there with us the whole time doing a, lo a lot of the work. Our goal there, he'd never really had a mission team come in before. So the first week we were there, we sat down with him, kind of brainstormed how we could best help him. And his main thing was he wanted young people to come to the church and be able to reach them. Because at that time, I think below 30, there was one Christian in his church, um, and then two who were just checking it out, but that was it. So he wanted to get more young people and youth into the church and, and kind of familiar with it, um, just because the Orthodox Church was really, really against them and kind of taught their people that Protestant groups were a cult. So it, it was kind of a stigma to be, even go near the church. So that's what we were for. We we're kind of reaching out um, that way. And one of the things, oh, Pastor. His name was actually, his last name was Pastor, so he's Pastor Pastor. <laughs> um, but that's what we did. And um, the first week we were there, like I said, we brainstormed, and we had to get adjusted to their sense of timing. And I, I just mean it like this. He had a friend that he was trying to witness to. And so what he did was he asked me and another one of the men to, he was building a shed. Uh, so we... We're, we're going to pour concrete for him. So the first day, he shows, he's like, be ready at 8, we're going to go right away, okay? So he shows up around 10. Uh, he's like, all right, let's have coffee first. So we have coffee. And about two hours later, he's like, you know what? Let's do it tomorrow. <laughs> so tomorrow he shows up. Be ready at 8. He shows up around 10 again. We get going around 12. We show up there. They don't have the supplies yet. So he tells them, buy the supplies. We'll do it the next day. And it's raining the next day. We wake up at 8, ready again. He shows up at 10. It's been raining all day. So we have coffee. We get up around 11 to go out. He get, looks up. He goes, oh, it's raining. We'll have to wait. <laughs> so we wait another couple hours. He walks out. It's still raining. We'll do it tomorrow. 
So we finally did it like ar around a week later, but that's kind of how we had to get adjusted to their sense of time and everything else. It wasn't as important. Getting things done wasn't as important. The people were more important, which, was, which is nice. It's just coming from a time schedule of you're late if you're not five minutes early was a little bit of a switch, and that's how the rest of the year seemed to go. Um, but one thing that was really cool about Macedonia and, and a lot of Eastern Europe, actually, is you have the really, really old mixed right in with new buildings. So right here, Heraclea, uh, this is before even Greek times, this, this ancient city here. Literally, we could walk out of the city, and it was right there. They were excavating it. So we had that. We had old Greek buildings. We had uh, World War II buildings, and, and all mixed within the city. Um, so what we decided finally by week two, one of the things we're going to do is teach English classes. One thing in Macedonia, uh, employment was low, but in order to get a job, even as a, a waitress or a server, you had to know English. So what we did was we taught English classes. That really it was they came to speak with Americans so they could learn their, their English better. Um, so we, we hosted that uh, and drew in a lot of people. Actually, the people on the right... Um, a couple of them were actually from California, but they come to Macedonia because that's where their family is from every summer. So we got to talk with them, and we even got to talk with a couple of their friends who are from Macedonia as well. So a big part of that was building the relationship as we taught them English, talking with them about Christ, about Jesus and what he did, and kind of going from there. So a lot of it was just building relationships as we were there. Another thing we did to help the church was we went out on the streets every night— um, so the mornings were in, and afternoons were really stro slow, but by night, that's when everyone came onto the streets. It was nice weather. They had coffee or beer or whatever right on the street there, so you could just go and talk with anyone. So what we did was we went with the church, and like I said, everyone who was a member of the church, a Christian, was there with us, and we're excited in doing it with us. Um, so one thing we did to kind of get the conversation started was we had these Bibles uh, and New Testaments to hand out, which is which is kind of interesting because we, we met around this time was Ramadan. So we met several Muslims who were very kind and interested in talking about the Bible, said they would read it. Whether they did, I don't know. But anytime, about half the time you tried to give it to someone who's Orthodox their whole life, they chucked it at you, literally threw it at you. We actually had one of our friends, he just, he was a little more bold, but he gave it to him. He's like, pretended he didn't understand it when they said they didn't want it. I'm like, why are you doing that? Because they just threw it right at the back of his head afterwards. It didn't work out as well. But we did get some people talking to us, and that was the main point. Talking with us, talking about the Bible. They said, oh, that's a bad book. I'm like, you're Orthodox Christian. This is what your faith is based on. So we kind of got them talking that way. We even actually at one point had the main Orthodox priest of the city come up and talk with us, mainly because he wasn't thrilled that we were handing out Bibles. But we, we engaged him in conversations. And the main point was just to let the pastor kind of take over too. So they would meet him, know that he's not some weird cult leader, and be able to engage that relationship farther. And that was our main goal there. Um, but we did get to bring several people into the church as well, which for a town of over 100,000 and you only have 20 Christians, even one or two makes, starts to make a huge difference. Um, now, like I said, a big part of it was relationship building. So Sonia and Oliver had been going to that church, but they were very much Orthodox, and they didn't know where they stood on it because they were raised Orthodox. But all that meant to them was these traditions and these ceremonies they went to. And then they started talking with the church on matters of faith and everything else. But like Pastor told us when we got there, there was no one really their age to connect with them. So all they knew were these people much older than them, and it wasn't— it wasn't talking on the same level, but when we came, it was a little different. They got to talk with us, ask why we're doing what we're doing, uh, and, and that, and kind of went from there. And it was actually really cool because on the very last day there, Oliver actually accepted Christ, and so did Sonia. Um, on the very last day, and we've been kind of keeping up with them as much as we could online, keeping up with the pastor uh, as well, and they've really been kind of engaging with the church, engaging in the Bible, learning, and, and trying to bring other people in as well, which was, which was cool to see. So after that month, we went to Albania. That was the next country. Uh, we went to Lege, Leze, whatever you want to call it. It actually depended on who you talked to, apparently. 
whether you're Macedonia, Southern, Albania, Northern, it, it just depended. Um, but what we did, we joined a ministry called Light Force Ministries. Sounds very Star Wars-ish, but it works. And they have this compound, sort of, that is part pig farm, part camp, which you wouldn't think worked together because of the smell, but they made it work. So uh, <laughs> every summer they bring in camps, a lot of times Christian camps. The church would bring some of the poor and the, the street kids from Albania, and they'd bring them to this camp. They'd teach them the Bible and other things. Um, and, and so we got to be kind of the counselors and the maintenance workers all rolled into one, depending whether there was a camp or whether there wasn't a camp and we just had to do the farm work and the maintenance and everything else. Um, the main thing I did when camp was I was part of activity, uh, teaching archery, which uh, <laughs> it was actually very interesting because from here to maybe four or five rows down, the target was only 10 yards away, 10, 15 yards. But they still found a way to not only miss the target, but the 15-foot backstop behind it sometimes. So you had to watch that out so they didn't kill any of the pigs further into the farm. <laughs> um, Albania, though, Albania was rough. It's, if you know anything about it, it's called the least religious country in the world. So uh, around the Soviet era, era, Albania was actually more communist than the Soviet Union. They were probably on the level of North Korea now as far as persecution of the church. Some say maybe even worse. Um, during that time up until, I believe it was 1990, they it finally became an open country. Um, and that means people my age, they were maybe one or two, but they still, they still had that. And their parents definitely had that. So it's, it's very unreligious and very closed off. Like you didn't open yourself up to people around you because when they were growing up, if you did that, that could land you in jail or worse, killed or your whole family killed. So it was very close as far as that went and it was very hard kind of reaching these people. Um, and they're very, very tough people. <laughs> There's fights all the time in camp. It was, it was crazy. But we were able to engage them in some conversations and we were able to... Uh, bring the people who brought them into the conversation some as well so that later on they could talk with them uh, and go further. Um, as far as people who actually come to know Christ during that month, it was one of those hard months that we didn't see a lot. We didn't see a lot of change as far as that went, but we knew, like, you know going into a country like that, you're not going to see fruits right away. It's not something that just happens instantaneously. So we just wanted to help the people who were already there, help them engage those people around them. But um, in the off weeks, when there was not a camp, not off weeks, off days really, when there wasn't a camp, we did farm work. So it was really gross, to be honest. We had to clean the pig pens, whitewash them, um, whitewash the walls, everything, garden pool weeds, whatever we had to do to make the campgrounds clean, to make the pig farming, which was how they raised money for that campground, to run as well and, and just help them out as far as that went. So the next month, we went to Moldova. So Moldova is the poorest country in Europe. It's right below the Ukraine. We were originally supposed to go to Actually, Turkey first, but then a lot of rioting broke out, so we're like, the Ukraine. Well, then the war broke out, so it was no longer the Ukraine. We had to go to Moldova. It's interesting, a lot of people think as far as conflict and, and chaos goes, the Middle East uh, is obviously bad, but Eastern Europe before that was, was kind of rocked by the, the Cold War and the effects of that, and it's still facing some of those consequences. Many people are still very nervous and worried about what's going on, especially with this war. We talked with people in Macedonia, and even they, much farther south, were scared that, you know, the Russians were going to take over the Ukraine, and then the Americans were going to attack the Russians, and then another world war. They were very nervous about it. Um, but we went into Moldova. Our job for Moldova was a little different this month. We didn't team up with one ministry. What we did was called Unsung Hero. So what that is is kind of a recruitment uh, what we do is we travel around the country trying to make contact with ministries and churches already in the area, um, see if they need help and how they could best use help and kind of partner with them to bring future teams in later for them. Um, 
Now, we did also get to work with them for a couple days just to get the feel of it. In Moldova, the main people we partnered with were, were CSC. Now, that is a branch of InterVarsity. Basically, it's a, it's a college ministry, and has different names depending on whatever country or area you're in. But in their capital of Chisinau, there are many, many colleges, but they have this little building in the city, and we partnered with them. We stayed with them. Uh, we went to some of the college, prayed, talked with some of their students, uh, uh, met with them, and asked them how they could use a team later on. They were very excited uh, because one of the things they said as far as what they needed, there's just so few actual Christians in Eastern Europe is what they're saying. And so they would love people to come and work with them, but they like they would love to do all these things. Like they were very passionate, the ones who you talk to, the ones who are doing ministry, but there's just not enough people to do the work. So they were um, all interested about bringing teams in. And so a couple of things we did with them, we actually went to right there on the, uh, the left side is a house you see us working on. What CSC did was they knew this lady who was in a village a couple miles outside, uh, well, kilometers, I guess, since it's not America, outside of the city of Chisinau, and she actually started a church there. She was the only Christian in the, her village and several villages around her, and so she started talking with people and eventually got to about 5 to 10 and she's like, well, we need a church. So sh- her house is where the church is at. And so she's so busy doing this work and other things and making a job, too, so that she can earn a living. She doesn't have a lot of time to do uh, f- maintenance on her house, till her garden, raise the farm uh, crops. So we came over, and we helped her do that one day. We harvested all our crops for the day and kind of cleaned up around the place for her. Um, And actually, that's one thing we found a lot in Moldova and even other places throughout Europe was you have all these villages, and there's very few converts, but the ones who are, it's almost all women. So it's a very conservative culture as well. And so a conservative culture, especially with Christianity, means that women cannot be leaders in the church, but only women are in the church in these countries. So they have this conflict. We actually met several people that were not pastors, but they did everything to run that church. And their main prayer was to have a man qualified to be pastor to come in and lead and help them out with that. Uh, And our prayer was for that too, not just for that, not just so they'd have a good leader, but because you, you can't reach a man as well unless you have other men trying to reach him. So that was a huge lack in Eastern Europe, especially Moldova. Um, so we spent a, a, about two weeks in the capital. Then we went up north to this town called Belt. I know that's not how it's spelled. I called it Balti until they corrected me. Um, but Belt's what we did. We, we teamed up with another branch of CSC there because it was a big city. They had several colleges. And we actually went to a church nearby. And this we got to speak and preach and share our testimony in the church, which was really cool. Meet with a lot of students there. Um, we got to help them. They were having a big conference, so we got to hand out flyers, talk with a lot of students on the college campus, which was, which was exciting. Uh, and just one of the things about it, it may be the poorest country, but you, whenever you show up, you are always the guest of honor, and they're going to feed you until you can't eat anymore, and then they're going to ask why you're not eating more, too. They have plates, tables full of food, and it it's, it's an interesting thing as a missionary because you know you're showing up in these poor countries. And, and a lot of times, like, not necessarily in Eastern Europe, but other places, the food that they're giving you, one, is, might be a little sketchy, but two, that's all they have for a, little, for a while. And you have this choice. You're like, I cannot eat it and offend them and, and kind of ruin the sharing of the gospel. Or I can eat it and then worry about them being able to eat later. So it was, it was really tough. Uh, as far as that went, um, and it really made you grateful for the food you did have and what they did give you. Um, and these pa- this pastor and his wife were some of the most graceful hosts we had. But on the left, you see uh, the conference they had for all the students in Baltz, uh, all the leaders and everything else that was working for this college ministry. And we got to talk with them. We got to share a little bit at that conference and really talk with the missionary there. Uh, his name in Baltz was Aiden, and he came from Great Britain, so it was, it was interesting speaking with another English speaker. We asked them the usual, you know, when you're trying to figure out uh, 
accents in America to figure out where someone's from. You say soda, you say Coke, you say pop. Apparently in Britain, it's fizzy drinks. Didn't know that, but that one's new. After a week there, we spent our final week in southern Moldova, which is a lot more villages, um, and it's even, it's even more impoverished. It was interesting because they have this harvest time festival, kind of like our Thanksgiving, and when we went to Baltz, we had it there, and then in the south, it comes a little bit later. So we went south, and they had another one there. So uh, it, it, it's more on when they harvest, not necessarily a day. But what we did was, what you'll see on the left is one of the elder ladies in that village, the, the first village we stayed at. Uh, we got to stay with her. We couldn't speak. She couldn't speak English, so we couldn't really speak with her until our translator was around. But uh, it was interesting. When we first showed up, we were just told we were going to meet someone. And so we got on the bus, we drove, and they dropped us off at this four-way intersection. We looked. There was no buildings except a small gas station anywhere around for miles. It's just this random bus stop on the side of the road. And then some guy drives up, and he doesn't speak English. He just speaks Russian. And he's like, you know, waving us into the car. I'm like, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm not sure about this. So we had to call, get a translator, and make sure that this was the right guy. It turned out it was. He was the pastor's brother. He drove us to the house we were staying at. We met the pastor who spoke some broken English. And then we got we to gotta talk at their church. We got to meet with the believers, pray with them, and preach, uh, sing a song. And, and really share the testimony with them, which was, which was fun. And then afterwards, the next day, we went out with the pastor, and we did some house, village, uh, house visits. So one thing they're really good at there, at least in the, the southern villages that I went to, is their uh, elder people in the church, and not even necessarily in the church, but just in the villages in general, who don't have children to take care of or feed them, a lot of them are just stuck in their house because of injuries or anything else. So they come and they bring them food and they clean up their houses and they help them out. So we got to do that and we got to pray over them, which was really cool, especially since some of these people, the only time people came to see them was when they came to bring them food. So, uh, And the next week we went to another village. And that's where I was talking about, about um, this leader there. She was a lady and she was a very passionate, great leader, loved the people in the village around her. She had an awesome testimony. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want her testimony for anything, but you really saw God work. When she grew up, her, her parents didn't actually want her. They, uh, her mom actually, when she was pregnant, tried to jump onto her stomach to, to abort the baby at the time, which was sad. And then she grew up in all this abuse and everything else and was able to escape away to America with some friends for a while. Uh, but then she came back. Because she loved, loved her town, loved her village, and wanted to bring them Christ. So that's where she's at now. And, and we heard all these horror stories about her growing up and her dad. And as we we're handing out food, she's like, actually, that's my dad right there. And so we stopped, gave him some food and everything else. Like, no bitterness in her at all. And he was still, he was drunk at the time, and he wasn't by any means a Christian. But she still tries. She still talks to him. So it was an interesting thing. But she told... She told us her main, her main prayer request is just that she can have help working because she runs all this on her own, but she, she wants people to come in and work with her. She wants someone to come in as a pastor to lead the church, which was, uh, it was sad, but at the same time, it was awesome to see her put in all this effort into the place. Um, so, but that's what we helped out with as far as our time there. Um, so the next month, we came over to Romania. This month, we teamed up with a church in Dragonesti, which is in the south. Um, and if you n know much about Romania, this section, Dragonesti Olt, was kind of a huge trafficking hub. It was a very dark place. Um, but in the middle of it was this pastor who ran Hope Church. Uh, and this is a church right in the middle of Dragonesti. But he doesn't just make it a church. He runs what's called Rezo Ministries. Uh, and what he does is he, sent, he trains up all these missionary pastors around him. And he sends them out to the villages all over the place so they can start churches there as well. And his goal is to keep doing that for all of Romania and then all of Eastern Europe. Um, and he's, he's a very gifted man as far as his knowledge of the Bible, as far as theology, and just he is always moving, doing something, planning. He's very organized with this. Uh, and his city of Dragonesti 
we each kind of broke off in teams of two or three on we had two teams there and we went off two or three people during the week to work during the day with uh one of their ministries mine was hope for the community and what they did was they ran an after school program you had a lot of gypsy kids in the area who didn't go to school a lot, didn't have their parents who could teach them school, so they're very uneducated, and when they fall behind in their education, it leads to several problems down the line. So to kind of combat that, what they did was ran this after-school program, and for about three hours, I had to um, keep all these kids focused and teach them their English and their math and everything else, and it, it, was, it was a big mix from people, for, from kids who were all the way ready in junior high but couldn't do simple one plus one additions to um, this girl right here, which is the daughter of Hope for Community. She was barely in kindergarten. She was already doing uh, multiplication and everything else. So it was, it was an interesting mix. Um, <laughs> but the main thing was you just had to wear them down in the first 30 minutes and then get them to focus afterwards. <laughs> And it helped, too, because by this point, I was growing out my beard. It was really long, and they, don't see, they didn't see that anywhere. Everyone else was clean-shaven. So you just, had to, you just had to agree with them grabbing hold of it and pulling the first couple of times. But after that, you were their favorite person in the world for a while. Um, so that's what we did during the day. We also did a lot in their church. We got to share our testimonies within the church as well. And then on the weekends, we went to those villages uh, that they were doing the house church plants with. And we preached, we shared our testimony and a song as well, and we got to meet with them for the whole weekend. So the, on Saturday, what we did, we would have half of us would go, and we would do house visits, pray for the believers there, uh, and meet with them and invite them. And, and then uh, the other team would invite all the kids from the area, and they would do this like hour and a half long, basically Sunday school class, talking with them, teaching them, and then on Sunday we'd have church. So that was our main thing for Romania was just that's what our, our looks like. It was very busy, uh, a lot of talking with people, a lot of teaching. Um, and then another thing we, we got to do towards the end, towards the last week, they were setting up another church plant um, in a, another major city. Uh, it was about two-hour drive away, and so we were doing kind of research in the area talking with people on the street, asking them, you know, about their, their religious beliefs and everything else, and if they would be interested in some of these ministries to be brought in. So we got to do a lot of kind of market research, I guess you can say, for a ministry. After that, was, that was our last country in Eastern Europe. So after that, we had our, uh, we went to India. So we had India and Nepal for Asia. So we drove it was a huge cultural shift when we got to India. It's a lot. It's a lot different. It's it was probably the culture-wise, the most bizarre place I've ever been to. You'd walk down the street, and let, well, actually, we played this game. So what our our main ministry was was every day we went to a village. We'd leave just after lunch. We'd get to the village. We'd meet with the pastor, talk with him. He would bring us to all of the uh, believers' houses, all of them in the village, and we'd pray over them, and we'd invite them into church. And then that night, one person would give their testimony, one person would preach, they would sing, everything else. And believers in India, they don't sing the same way as us. They're so fast-paced and clapping. It's crazy. It was fun, but it was a lot different. Uh, and we got to preach and share the gospel. Then afterwards, they'd come up, and we'd pray with them again. Um, but we did that every day, except for Saturday was our break day. So it was a lot of preaching, a lot of praying, a lot of meeting with different people. Uh, and literally driving to the village, this is how different the culture is. We'd play a game, you know, like slug bug, where you'd punch if you saw a certain car. Well, it would it'd be a little different here. For every person you saw peeing on the side of the street, it was one hit, two for everyone pooping. And it, by the end of the, by the time we got there, we were bruised. There's so many people. It's just, it's not the same culture. Uh, and, and, and that went for everything as well. Like in America, you have this big um, economic divide between rich people and then very poor people in the inner city. And you have that in India too, except the rich person can have their huge mansion house right here. And then literally right next door, you can have this little shack with a family of eight in one room. Uh, so it was, 
is definitely unique. Uh, a lot of people <laughs> everywhere you went, but it was it was probably one of my favorite months. A lot of a lot of people hearing the gospel, a lot of people turning from their Hindu culture, which uh, if you know about Hindu culture, they're very quick to accept Jesus because he's just a god among their several thousand gods. So that's not the hard part. The hard part is for them to accept Jesus as the only God, the only way. And that's a lot different, a lot more confrontational when you stand up there <laughs> and you preach that. Um, especially, they have this thing, every church we went to, when they preach, when they sing, they have this huge speaker on the outside, and the whole village hears you. So it's not just those people who came to you hearing you preach about how Jesus is the only God, the only way. It's the whole village, everyone who didn't want to come as well. So that was that was interesting, but it was it was really cool to see, too. And, and it, it was cool, too, because we saw s- so many people in India say, oh, I get it now. Like, it just clicked in their head. They're like, not just Jesus and all these other gods, but Jesus as the only God. And it clicked in their heads. And then, so we always teamed up with the local pastor. He always followed it up. But that was, it was really cool to see. And it was really nice to be able to help them out. Um, just because this ministry is just so overwhelmed, once again, for people. You have a pastor, but he was a pastor of four or five different villages. He would go, he would have to preach at a different village almost every day, meet with his congregation. They were always running around keeping busy. So it was nice to be able to come in, help them out, give them kind of a relief. But right here you see our team. Uh, and on the right-hand side in the middle, that is Pastor K. He's our translator. So he went with us wherever so that we could talk. Uh, and it, we, we know that the gist of our message got through, but we're not entirely sure how well he translated. Because there are certain times when we're being really serious in our sermons and people would start laughing. So I think there are some cultural differences, cultural gaps that weren't translated as well. But the main points were. Uh, And then our team on the left, they have these little, they're basically golf carts called tuk-tuks, and that's their taxis for the area. And we'd squeeze all seven people into that. Sometimes they'd pick up two or three more. So that's just how they travel around. Um, And you'll see here a couple pictures of us as we're praying after service and then kind of preaching. Sometimes it's in the church, but this was our first night. This was actually, we got to preach out um, in the village. And the first night kind of set the tone for us. Our first night out in the village, you had to be very flexible. When we get there, we didn't really know what we're going to do. We got there, said, all right, we're going to go pray. So we went and prayed with people. It's like, okay, now who's going to preach for tonight? It's like, oh, um, I guess I will. I'll preach. And then someone shares their testimony. And they're like, okay, what songs are you going to sing? It's like, oh, um. So we had to meet together, find a song we kind of knew. We sang, shared testimony. As it's going on, they thought that the whole village was going to come at first, but at first it was only just children. So they're like, okay, make sure the message is for, for children. It's like, okay. I had to kind of change in my head what I was going to speak. And then towards the end, when we're getting closer and closer, more parents start showing up and more and more. So I'm like, okay, I guess I'm going to have to change once again to make sure everyone. But what I ended up doing in the end was just, I mean, teaching the gospel from the beginning to the end, from, from God creating the earth, man sinning to Jesus dying on the cross for us because that was only that was one of the things I could think of that translated no matter what age you were at so it's always safe bet if you don't know your crowd just I mean preach the gospel don't have to worry as much about age and and you have a translator anyway so you had to keep it simple next month uh, we went to Nepal we actually started off, if you've seen the, the news about the earthquake, right in the Kathmandu Valley, where all that is occurring now. Um, Nepal, Nepal is probably one of the most beautiful countries besides Macedonia I went to. But what you have to understand, it was also closed. And in India as well, but especially in Nepal, you had all these pastors who were uneducated to the point where the only reason they could read was they learned to read so they could read the Bible and then preach. Was To see that dedication was, was awesome because these guys are very poor and working and learning to read and taking care of their church all at the same time. And so that's what we met in Nepal. 
Um, and this man actually right here. So we did another Unsung Hero Month where we were meeting people. Uh, and I led it this month, um, meeting churches and ministries in the country and seeing if we could help them out. And the first day out, we actually, it was a long story how we met this guy. We met someone who ran a restaurant in the area. And there's this local uh, ethnic group of music performers. So back in the day, he said they used to make their living by traveling and, and doing these musical performance. And at the same time, they'd give their news. But as, you know, times changed, people started getting internet and they didn't need them for news or other stuff. They had to adjust to make a living. So he made a restaurant for them. And so th this is the pastor uh, in Kathmandu for that people group. Um, and so we met the owner of the restaurant. He's like, oh, have you met this guy? So we went, we talked with him. And what he does is he makes sarangis. That's that instrument right there. That's kind of the traditional string instrument for Nepal. Uh, and he, I mean, he makes, he's skilled. He makes them from scratch, like cuts his own wood and everything and carves this out, which is really cool. Uh, and we went to his house and he had the church right there in his, in his yard. And we were able to talk with him. Um, but what we found is with that education so low, I mean, some, some guys just got it from reading the Bible. They understood. But you also had a lot of weird theological beliefs start to sneak in, too, when they don't have the education or the training. And one thing that really started to hit home, especially in Nepal for me, is a lot of people say that we in America are rich. And, and with that wealth that God gives us is a responsibility to help our brothers and sisters around the world. Uh, to, to further the gospel, but that doesn't always just mean money. Like sometimes we throw money at an issue without bothering to see where our money goes and it does more harm than good. But one thing I noticed was we're also very wealthy in education and skill. Like I could come in and I have all these resources to, to teach me how to study the Bible well, and I know how to read since I've been a little kid, so it, it helps. And, and they just don't have that opportunity as much. So one of the, the, some of the most effective ministries I, I saw there were missionaries who came in to teach the pastors and the leaders in that area so that they could preach and reach their own people. And it was, it was really cool to see a lot of that in Nepal. But we started in Kathmandu. Uh, then we went to a city in southern Nepal and then Pokhara which is kind of more the middle. And, and what we met along the way is a lot of the same. A lot of uh, small village pastors who were working, who started their own church and were just doing what they could. So we tried to help them as much as we could. We, we preached, we taught, we, we met with their believers and prayed for them. And, and it was cool seeing the house visits and seeing the pastors talk to his people and then just seeing one by one, like small little churches, but one by one more people to come to know God. So there, there I'm kind of on the left uh, preaching at one of the churches. Another thing about Nepal is their roads are really bad, and a lot of places you have to trek. So. All